welcome everyone on this fabulous Thursday. I was going to say July 5th. Oh my goodness, it's August 5th. Wow, time is going by fast. September, October, November, and December, my four favorite months are coming up, so I'm super excited for that. Anyways, you are listening to another episode of the Afterlife Chronicles and Beyond. I am your host, Nicole Strickland, on the WLTKDB network. That's WLTKDB.com as well as the Let's Talk.com. Lots of new stuff added to the brand new website. Please get over there and check it out. We are broadcasting simultaneously, well, on the site, but you can go to Facebook, Twitch, YouTube, Twitter, and then next week we are going to be broadcasting live from LinkedIn as well. So you can just find twitter.com WLTKDB, youtube.com WLTKDB. You get the get the uh, just there, just WLTKDB. Just say it over and over and you're going to get used to saying it and you're going to memorize it. So anyways, I have a little in the background. I know it's, it's still light out, but you can kind of see it. I have this light that kind of you can switch different colors. It's one of those little accent lights. And so I have it set to green just because I was in a green mood today, which is fine. And then also uh, I put up some Halloween lights because it's time for that. So anyways, I hope you're all doing a or having a good night, I should say. Uh, it's weird because I co-host Hana Voices Radio on Tuesday nights and then I do this show on Thursday nights. But Thursday always seems like Tuesday to me. It's the weirdest thing. But anyways, yeah, the weekend's coming up. This week is flying by fast. So enough of me rambling. I'm really looking forward to having Lon Strickler on. He is a 14 researcher, author, blogger at the highly popular and syndicated Phantoms and Monsters blog. You can get there by visiting phantomsandmonsters.com. He's also an accomplished author, uh, many, many books, uh, Winged Cryptids, Humanoids, Monsters, and Anomalous Creatures Casebook, Alien Disclosure, Experiencers, Expose, Reality, Mothman Dynasty, Chicago's Winged Humanoids, and many more. And so, Lon, thank you so much for joining me tonight, and welcome to the Afterlife Chronicles. How are you, my friend? Hey, Nicole. It's been a while. It's been a long time. Yeah, it's been a while. I know it's been forever and now I'm returning favor. I've been on your show a few times and now I have you on mine. So Absolutely. welcome aboard. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Well, it's always great talking with you. So I figured we get into a little bit of uh, some cryptids and all that cool stuff tonight. So uh, I, like, Ready to go. I like to, yeah, I like to start out, you know, I mean, some people are, kind of unsure about starting out with the whole oh how did you get started in the field you know blah 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 but I like to start out with that I like to hear about people's journey as a as a paranormal researcher and so I would love let's talk about yours how did you get into all this good stuff well I started young I was <laughs> um, I was actually around eight or nine when I was I was born and raised near Gettysburg so I used to spend a lot of summers out on the battlefield so I'd get on my bike and, and go down the road and, uh, well, you know, spend a summer afternoon there. And one day I was in an area they call uh, Valley of Death, which is um, between Little Round Top, Devil's Den, and the Wheat Field. Right. And I was on the road, <clears throat> and all of a sudden, just like a, a TV screen opened up, and <clears throat> all my senses were heightened. I was seeing... I was seeing soldiers. I was hearing gunfire. Oh my uh, gosh. Smelling gunpowder the whole nine yards. And uh, that kept up for about 30 seconds. And, you know, I'm sitting there standing there stunned. And uh, then this thing went away. So that was really the day I knew something was up. You know, I always thought that I had some abilities, but, you know, being a kid like that, you don't, you don't think, man. Right. Yeah. So, um, and, you know, I didn't live in a haunted house. I didn't do any, you know, I didn't really have any concept of spirits and ghosts and anything, really. So uh, that day, you know, that was kind of the day it started. And, um, you know, I am intuitive. I can pick up on spirit energy. I've been doing spirit rescue work for a long time now, a remote viewer. So, uh, yeah. So, in fact, we did, my associate and I did five hours today. So, uh, 
Yeah, we keep busy. Wow. Oh, my goodness. You know, that's so interesting. Gettysburg. I can't believe I haven't been there yet. And I know Dale Katzmerich's Ghost Research Society is going there, I believe, this coming <clears throat> weekend. So I <clears throat> wanted to make it, but unfortunately, with work and all that, I couldn't go. But Gettysburg, I mean, I've, I've heard so many amazing things. I mean, not just the battlefield, but a lot of the buildings around it and everything. Right. I mean, it's just, it's like, it, I mean, it's such a hotbed of activity. And it makes sense because of all the tragedy that occurred there i mean how many total how many total men died there i mean thousands oh it was um like 30, i think it was all kinds of casualties missing everything i think it was like 120 thousand. Oh, okay a lot more hello i was way yeah, off on that it was, it was a lot so that was the 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 introduction to your your abilities and and you getting basically hooked on the paranormal i didn't yeah, realize that was, in, that, that was in the mid that was in um Early 70s, actually. And you were eight years old, you said? Yeah. In fact, I'd say 68, 1968. I was about nine or 10. Wow. And uh, yeah, so uh, as I got older and I was in high school, I started doing paranormal investigations on my own. And back then, you know, the early 70s, you know, nobody did anything like that. You know, I know. You, you tell somebody you're a paranormal investigator, they kind of really look at you weird. <laughs> I know. And, uh, <laughs> So that's what I did. And it was word of mouth back then. And um, if somebody had an issue, I would eventually get around to me. I'd go take a look, give an idea of what was going on. But I wasn't clearing back then. I wasn't doing any spirit rescue work or anything like that. I was just, at that time, I hate to admit it, I was just out there looking for evidence. And, you know, so I, I just wanted to hone my skills a bit. Yeah, So um, Absolutely. You know, as time went on, and I continued doing it, I got I had gotten married, and um, I moved down to Maryland, and I continued to do that. And uh, then I had the uh, the Bigfoot encounter in May of '81, and that was down in Sykesville, Maryland, near Sykesville, Maryland, and uh, that's kind of where my world of cryptids opened up. You know, I became very, very interested. I wanted to know what I saw. I wanted to help explain the uh the phenomena and uh that's kind of where it took off yeah it's like the rest is history right yeah. i mean the word paranormal i mean it encompasses it all ghosts spirits cryptids ufos all of that do you prefer investigating cryptids as opposed to ghosts and hauntings or is it kind of a 50 50 sort of thing for you i will get involved with a haunting or an um something that's attached if somebody calls me in yeah uh spirit rescue can kind of involve a lot of things if you open up sessions and they start showing up you can start moving on uh but if i do rvs and, and working with a client uh there's a process and uh yeah it takes a while sometimes i mean i've been involved with cases for years you know right you know it's I in fact I've been working on one case for eight years now. And most of that is uh just aftercare and just keeping keeping up with the clients and making sure everything stays. A lot of times I work with people who are beacons and yeah. uh who who have the ability to uh sense spirit energy, it attracts to them. Uh they suffer sometimes in an attachment. But a lot of times their kids are also beacons. And, you know, I'm kind of the guy who has to sit there and talk to them a bit about being a psychic and what to expect as they grow. And I've gone through that a few times with with children. Uh, so, you know, I, I there have been some success stories. I mean, there's one girl in particular who's 17 now and she's quite a ver she's quite a good little psychic. Guy. <laughs> and uh, she's uh she understands what it encompasses and it doesn't scare her like it used to. But, uh, you know, that's about all I do now as far as spirit work. But as far as cryptids and other paranormal, that's the bulk of my work. You know, that's what people contact me about. And when we get into a big investigation, yeah, that's what we do. And I, I've got a really good team uh, all over the country. It's... Um, we got boots on the ground on a lot of cases. 
awesome. I mean, I mean, you know, you don't hear of people spending eight years on a case. I mean, a lot of times it's a one night thing and that's it, but it's so important to follow up with the clients, you know, because it's, I mean, what can you really gather in just eight hours? Right. It's, it's of my opinion that people should investigate a house or a business or a historical site for months, years to really get a good idea of what's going on. So, Oh yeah, you've been doing this. So, you know, uh, you know exactly like what's going on. Uh, it takes time and, uh, it's not like on TV where, you know, you see them for an hour and they maybe encompass a couple of nights on there. Well, it just doesn't work out that way. Exactly. It's not, yeah. It's not an open shut book. I mean, you know, uh, these cases, especially where you're, you're talking about malevolency, it takes a mm-hmm. while. It really, yeah, absolutely. Your team, so you have people from all over uh, the United States, I'm, I would imagine internationally as well, uh, f- for for actual, like, let's say, ghost research versus cryptid research. What are some of the similarities and differences between those two that you've discovered? Because, I mean, you really have your hand in, in the cryptid business, so you, yeah. you guys know. There's a lot of connections. Um most cryptid activity will also have uh, a possible spirit connection, uh, something unexplained uh, that that's connected to it. A lot of cryptid sightings do that. Yeah, uh, you know, there have been Bigfoot sightings in particular where there there has been orb activity and and other strange uh, activity, even UFOs and. Um, you know, that kind of comes with the territory. When you're doing this full time, like we are, uh, it's something that you start to notice very quickly. Right. And the patterns of course, and I've everything. I've been doing this for 40 years altogether. So, you know, I, I've seen a lot of different and heard a lot of different things. You know, it's interesting because I always I, I'm of the opinion that there's some sort of like nexus between all these beings, mm-hmm. you know, and it, it makes sense. I mean, hearing you talk, it's like it does seem like you know you can have a ufo encounter and then have other types of beings and and whatnot so it's interesting how that all plays out and exactly what that nexus is i'm not sure if we're ever going to figure that out but it does seem like there's some you know connection between all these different beings which is to me like super intriguing but i think we're getting closer i really do i think the um uh the overall paranormal field is a little more open-minded than it used to be people are starting to accept yes the uh out of out of the box uh type of activity and um you know when they can't explain it out of hand then that's when you got to start going into the woo factor and start figuring ah something else is going on exactly and not everyone is so timid and scared of the woo factor anymore yeah people are more open to it absolutely my goodness so uh what's your i mean because you've been doing i I mean i've probably been on like one or two cryptid investigations in my Mm -hmm. whole life i specialize more in the, the ghost and spirit and hauntings realm but what is your standard protocol for from like i guess start to finish when investigating, let's say Bigfoot or you know the Dogman or Mothman or any other type of cryptid, well, it depends on the case. Um, yeah, if you get a flap with a lot of sightings, like we're involved now with the uh, Chicago Lake Michigan winged humanoid uh, phenomenon yes. that's been going on now. So, well, it's really started back in 2011, but it started to really pick up in 2017. And that, those cases kind of fell in our lap from the very beginning. Of course, MUFON got a lot of the early cases, but they didn't follow up on them. So what happened was these these people who were making the reports contacted us. And uh, there was there was two of us, uh, Manuel Navarrete and I, were working on this stuff anyway. This was out of interest, really. Yeah. And uh, we started making it known that, you know, if you – you know, if you want to report it to us instead of move on, feel free to do so. We will check it out and we'll go ahead and, uh, you know, help you. And uh, that's what happened. And as time went on, they really started to pick up that 2007 was really unbelievably busy. We were, um, I think we got a little over 50, 50 credible sightings that year. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Just for and, that. One, oh, my gosh. Yeah. And it really, 
it really snowballed around July and August. And of course, for people who know about the Mothman and the apparent history of it, the harbinger theory, you know, that brings tying, you know, bad news, bad you know, disasters and such. I was getting phone calls literally 24 seven from residents in the Chicago area who were scared to death that something was going to happen, that this was something that was foretelling some type of disaster. Oh my goodness. So fortunately that did not happen. But, you know, since that time, you know, we had a steady stream of sightings year round, you know, it didn't matter what the weather or whenever. Uh, but around October, 2019, then most of the sightings started to concentrate around O'Hare International. And since that time, I'd say 80%, if not more, of the sightings have been at or in around the airport. So do you have a theory as to why? Do you think it's technology-based, interested in, in, in advanced technology or something like that? You know, it could be. Right. Uh, you know, there's a lot of different things that... Uh, just for instance, just like particle accelerators and such. And there is a particle accelerator out in Cook County, uh, you know, which has been running off and on, you know, and it's kind of a hush hush deal out there. You know, who's to say they didn't fire that thing up and open up a rift? Exactly. Fabric, you know, but I, I do well believe, be. I believe it's one of two, if not both, uh, uh, as far as the theory goes, it's possibly an interdimensional being that's able to move between uh, portals, vortexes, or whatever the situation is. Uh, more so dimensions than, than realities. Right. Or it's extraterrestrial. And I, uh, we have had evidence to suggest that it may very well be extraterrestrial. We've had a, a UFO sighting there at the airport that uh, where a, a humanoid was literally seen being brought up into the craft. Oh, my goodness. We've had uh, small alien being sightings, small humanoid sightings at the airport. And it's usually in a specific area around the, the cargo area. And the uh, there's actually uh, O'Hara has a, a cemetery there. Uh, it's Rest Haven Cemetery. Been there since they built it. And the activity seems to be around that cemetery. Uh, oh, that's we've had intriguing. a lot of major sightings in and around that cemetery. Oh, I bet you've researched like all who's buried there and all that to see if there's any sort Yeah, of we've gotten a lot of different, you know, a lot of different information. We're working on some new theories now. Um possible ley line activity uh oh absolutely on that and uh if uh vortexes are opening up because of cross ley lines and such so we got to look into that we're going to try to get you, you hear of the mothman and then you hear of this winged creature around the chicago area do you think it's the same or do you think it's a different different from the standard you know mothman sightings that people have had yeah i i think it's different uh, to a degree, um, I, th I think it may, you know, the Mothman in Point Pleasant, I had thought for a long time was a, um, a summoned being. And the reason I say that is because all the indigenous spirit energy around Point Pleasant. I've actually heard that theory before myself. It, it makes sense. It's, it's, it's palpable. I mean, I've been involved yeah. with investigations there where the EVP and I mean, uh, response has been unbelievably strong. And uh, I think that that strong energy may have actually summoned this being from some dimension or somewhere else. Or, so that was in around that West Virginia Ordnance Works area, what people call the TNT plant. So, you know, that, that one year period of 66 and 67, there were about 30 really viable reports made. And, uh, yeah, so that all culminated into a lot of other activity, UFO, men in black, uh, paranormal activity, a lot of ghost activity and stuff. It's and funny then, how of that course, happens. the uh, collapse of the Silver Bridge where 46 people died. Uh, so, you know, I don't know if that's really related to it, but a lot of people seem to think it was a harbinger. 
Could very well be. And hold that thought. We're going to get more into that okay. right after the break. So stay tuned, folks. You are listening to the Afterlife Chronicles and beyond on the WLTKDB network with guest Lon Strickler. We will be right back. evidence. We scour the internet searching for true paranormal captures, information, and education. New methods mixed with old methods of capturing this mysterious phenomenon. Well, look no further for your ghostly voices than ghostly-voices.com. Nicole Tito and Lisa Crick take you on a journey into their paranormal world and provide you with true EVP and ITC audio captures compelling information on debunking, some hilarious bloopers, and more. Remember, these two are veterans in the field and know how to capture the true evidence you are looking for. Ghostly-Voices.com Your paranormal stop for true audio evidence. Ghostly-Voices.com mystery, a book of one man's journey, a book of the afterlife, a book you must read. Ghost in Me by five-time award-winning author Kevin Killen is a book of one man's journey in the search of the afterlife. Read of his chilling childhood experience, his investigative journeys, and his opinions of paranormal activity. Ghost in Me by Kevin Killen. An Ozark Mountain publication. Get your copy today online or wherever books are sold. Two minutes past the hour, you are tuning into the Afterlife Chronicles and beyond on the WLTKDB network. That's WLTKDB.com. You can also get to the site by visiting the Let's Talk.com. I am your host, Nicole Strickland, and tonight we have been talking with Lon Strickler, Fortean researcher, author, and blogger of the syndicated Phantoms and Monsters blog at phantomsandmonsters.com. So before the break, we uh, were talking a little bit about Lon's journey. A little bit about some of the similarities and differences between, uh, you know, ghost research versus cryptid research. And then uh, right before the break, uh, talking about the uh, winged creature, humanoid creature that's been seen around the uh, Chicago O'Hare airport. So let's get back into that. You know, what I'm interested in is, is if there's a pattern in who witnesses these types of beings. You know, is it Quite mostly frankly, men it, or mostly yeah. women or, you know, that that fascinates me. It's a wide range. You know, I, so I thought that we, yeah, I thought that there would be a certain type of individual who would end up doing that, but no, really. It, it Really? Went, yeah, all socioeconomic levels, uh, different neighborhoods. Um, it was a mix. And the, the interesting thing about this whole investigation from the beginning has been that the witnesses and for those who are familiar with uh, cryptid investigations, uh, the witnesses stuck to their original story. They never embellished on it. Even when our investigators tried to get them to prod them into saying something, yeah, maybe you saw this. But no, that never happened. They stuck. Wow. To it. it was almost like they were imprinted by it. And but, uh, you know, that's that's a good theory, that's a good point, right there. Yeah, because you would think that someone would try to embellish it, but no, they didn't. I mean, you know, we have had 126 viable sightings so far over this uh, ever since uh 2011. And I, you know, any any of those people that come forward and start changing what they said, they come at right, they come right out of the queue. 
I will pull them off. And, uh, you know, I, I will not count that as a sighting. And, right. uh, yeah, so, you know, it, it, it's been a remarkable investigation overall. But some of the factors that have come forward with it, like the extraterrestrial possibilities and UFOs and uh, people seeing these things suddenly appear, then suddenly disappear. Uh, you know, the red eyes, which were very, you know, similar to what was seen at Point Pleasant. Yeah. But the wings themselves, for the most part, now we've had different types. And I have, I do believe that there have been at least three or four different beings that have come through over time. And early on, we we had a few of the insectoid type wing, butterfly wings thing, um, moth moth wings. Uh, then it kind of uh, started getting the owl feathered wings. We had three or four of those, and we have had one or two here and there. But I'd say the vast majority have been the bat or gargoyle like membrane wings, and you know the the beings themselves have been described. For the most part, as uh, five to six foot in height, we had one that was seven foot just the other day. Uh, many had the red eyes. They're dark in color. Sometimes they're seen as being shiny or wet, very emaciated body. Uh, sometimes the head is small and thin, but the wings are, are quite leathery, like just like a bat or gargoyle and the uh the wingspan goes anywhere from 10 to foot 15 foot total that's so incredible. these are quite a good size being and uh the witnesses other than public have been we've had officials uh police officers uh we had somebody in the mayor's office contact us wow uh at the airport we've had tsa security contact us uh pilots uh air traffic controllers that makes sense people worked at the airport yeah it, it runs the gamut but i tell you uh we've had people coming forward and in fact i i have i do have a source at one of the airlines who's a ground supervisor and they're telling me that uh you know they had been hearing all this going on when, years ago when it started so, you know, when we started out doing the investigation, I was actually calling it the Chicago Phantom. Well, of course, when the press got a hold of it, they started, you know, they started saying, ah, well, we're going to call it the Mothman since, you know, that sounds good because the Mothman prophecies and everything. Right, so, right. You know, so that's what they started calling it the Mothman, uh, Chicago Mothman. But then people out at the airport, they're calling it the O'Hare Mothman. So that's kind well, of what we're go. getting now. Oh, my God. You know, I'm wondering if it has to, you know, like when you hear of a like an earthbound or a ghost, you know, there's different stages right. of manifestation. You might have just a silhouette. Then you might be able to see some skin color and, and, and some fe facial features. I'm wondering if it's <clears throat> similar to this particular creature and that maybe as it gains more energy, you're able to make more out of it. I don't know. That's just a thought. I don't it's know. a possibility, I guess. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I don't know. I mean, the. It it is interesting that you know overall you know the the uh, descriptions have been very similar, uh, and and I'd say most of the people that come forward had no idea that this is a being these things have been seen, uh, you know even with all the publicity and everything, but there are a lot of people had no idea what this thing was or heard about it, God, and that's uh, many times it's seen in groups and. Uh, you know, this last, we had a sighting on the 22nd of 22nd of, of July, and uh, it was reported to us last week, and it was um, it was three employees at United Cargo who had got off work about 1030, and they were walking out to their car, and they saw this thing out, uh, out by, just past the, uh, the parking lot. Over by the cemetery again. I mean, this was only like a hundred yards from the cemetery, and T the TSA uh, security actually showed up and were surrounding it. 
Uh, they saw the vans in the whole nine yards, and as they had their lights on, started walking towards us. The thing flapped its wings and started taking off, and it circled above them and was gone. Now, another aspect of these creatures is they have the ability to ascend without use of their wings, almost like a rocket. Yeah, it reminds really me strange. of uh, the Jeepers Creepers character in the movie. Well, you know what? Yeah. If, if you read the book, <laughs> yeah. uh, I've had many witnesses refer to the Jeepers Creepers. Right. And, yeah. You know, and I got a whole chapter in there, Creepers Jeepers. Oh, my God. Jeepers that's Creepers. hilarious. Yeah. Oh my, I'm wondering if there's like some relic or something at that cemetery besides just maybe a, a connection to someone that's buried there. That's so. Uh, I don't know. You know, it's, uh, I, you know, the, I, I guess the possibilities are endless, but yeah, you know, right. some of the stuff that, you know, some of the, you know, the in depth research I've been doing, uh, it, it may open up a few new doors to us. We're looking into a few things. Uh, this ley line possibility, because this is the only open ground right. at the airport. That makes uh, total with, sense. The cemetery, but of course, if it's a ley line, it's running underneath all the concrete and moving out beyond beyond the airport into the city. So, exactly. who's to say uh, that there's a connection there? So, that's something yeah, else know. we're going to follow up on. It's, that's the beauty of this field because, you know, you have all these theories and, you know, doors don't necessarily close, but it's good to have all these doors open because it may lead somewhere. Absolutely. It's just, it's just so fascinating, all of this. And then Bigfoot. I want to hear about your Bigfoot encounter. Okay. Well, oh, my God. I know you've probably shared it a gazillion <laughs> times, right? I know, but yeah, it's, I want to uh, hear it. But for you, I would definitely tell you. I am. Um... <laughs> If it's if it's okay to share, you know, yeah, some no people problem. Are, I I had know, an encounter. Right. I also had a winged humanoid encounter in '88. And I Ooh. You about that so um, this was uh, May of 1981. I was fly fishing on the south branch of the Patapsco River, just east of Sykesville, Maryland, about a mile away. And this is an area I was very familiar with. I'd been there dozens mm -hmm. of times, and. Uh, I was actually standing in the river with chest waders on, and I there was a dog, pretty good sized dog on the other side of the, the river. Now the river at this point is pretty narrow; it's probably about twenty yards at the most. And wow. uh, this dog was over there. There was some uh, some pretty tall weeds over there on the north bank, and uh, as I watched it, it was just kind of going in and out, moving around. So I went back to fishing, didn't pay it any mind. But a couple minutes later, I heard a yelping. And it left out a long, a loud yelp. And uh, when that happened, I looked over there, and I saw this thing stand up in the, in the brush. And I could see it from about mid-chest up. And it was hairy, kind of dark brownish in color. Uh, I didn't really get a good look at it until it started moving to my left out of the, the weeds and walked out of the weeds standing on the bank of the river and turned towards me. And we locked eyes. Now, this thing is definitely male because you can oh see the genitalia gosh. in this thing. I think it was about 40 yards away from it. And uh, it was making a clicking sound like it was gnashing its teeth. Uh, I didn't know what it was at the time, but I figured out that's what it was. And we we looked at each other. And I, looking at it, the first thing I thought was that huh, this is like a Neanderthal or some type of yeah. man. And, right. uh, you know, but it had the conical head. It had the real deep brow ridge. But, you know, if I had had a gun, I wouldn't have shot it because it looked more human to me. So, um, had a lot of hair. I mean, there's no doubt about that, but it was pretty good. size. about eight foot. Good size. That is a definitely, yeah, that's a good size right there. Yeah. Did it and, smell? Uh, you hear of the smells, well, too, with these there creatures. was an odor, a slight odor, it was, and it reminded me of fox urine. Now, I used to use fox urine when I used to go hunting to mask <clears throat> my scent when I went deer hunting. So, that's what it mm -hmm. sounded like. Now, I have heard tales of them using... Uh, skunk uh urine or or fox urine and a lot of other things the mask you know when they're hunting i don't know yeah i don't know how true that is but anyway this thing we looked at it we locked out about 10 seconds 
And, uh, you know, I, what am I going to do? I'm just standing here in the water. I'm looking at this thing. And it turned quickly and started moving fast up into the, uh, into the woods. So what I did is I, I hauled out of the, uh, the river. Yeah, no kidding. Car and got in the car and drove into town and, and called the police. I told them what I saw, you know, I don't know if they believed me, but I, they told me, they said, well, go back and we'll have an officer come and talk to you. And I figured when I get back here and it's only like a three or four minute drive, I'll be right. sitting there waiting for an hour before somebody shows no, up. No, I bet but someone showed up right away. To my amazement, <laughs> there was a uh, Maryland State Police officer there with one of those uh, wooden barriers already across the road. Oh, my God! So I pulled up there and I, I told him, look, I made the report. He said, you got to get out of here. I said, well, why? I said, they told me to come back. I said, I don't care. You got to go home. Get out of here. Go where? So I went home. I lived in Sykesville. So, I, you know, I, it didn't take me long to get home. So, uh, <laughs> so about an hour later, I decided, well, I'm going to get in my car and drive back up. And I did. And when I got there, I mean, it was like, uh, it was like uh, Grand Central Stadium. It was crazy. Um, there were cars parked up and down the road. I had to walk about a quarter mile to get back to the barrier. And uh, they had tape and stuff all over in the woods. They had dogs and trainers, you know, searching around. And they had a big white tent set up across the river. Oh, my goodness. Uh, I could hear the helicopters. Didn't see any helicopters. Heard them. And back then, the, the feds used to drive those black wagoneers. They had two of those sitting there. They had Howard County cops. They had uh, city, uh, Maryland State Police. And they had the uh, local Sykesville cops there. So eventually, I, um, I, I, went, I went home. I didn't stick around. And uh, I, I called some of the news, some news stations in Baltimore. And told them what happened. They said, oh, yeah, we're interested. Give us a call in a couple of days. We'll call you or whatever. Well, five days later, they, you know, nobody calls me. or So I call one of them. And they hang up on me. They don't want to talk to me. So I um, I, I later did find out that somebody had had a sighting of this thing about three hours before, uh, about five miles downstream in Marriottsville. And they had called, but that isn't what sent all that authority, all the authorities out there. Something was going on. I believe now for those people that uh, are familiar with the Baltimore, Washington area, there's a lot of facilities and buildings out in the boondocks that are, aren't marked. Uh, they're federal facilities. Nobody knows what's going on there. Who's to say this thing some, was something that was escaped and they were chasing it down? Uh, that's always been my theory. I think I think this thing escaped somehow, and they were looking for it. And as soon as they'd get a call, that or makes sense. Respond to it. I mean, so, to have um, all those cars and all the you know the tents set up and everything like yeah. that. I mean, obviously they knew something. They knew more than they were letting on. That that tells right. So forty years later, I really don't know what what happened yet. You know, I don't know what the whole thing was now. Of course, that spurred my interest. Now, about eight years before that, there was a phenomena and some sightings of what people were calling the Sykesville monster. And uh, a lot of the residents that lived along the river in Sykesville had this thing going into homes, into kitchen, into um, uh, chicken coops, garages and stuff, just making a mess of things. And what people described what it was, they said it was, looked like a Bigfoot. And, uh, you know, then with my sighting and after I later on, when BFR formed, I gave them a call and told them what I had seen back then. So, uh, you know, I was talking to a lot of the old witnesses back in from that time. I, I was lucky enough to be working with one of the gentlemen who was uh a relative with many of these people. So he gave me, got me access to a lot of these witnesses. And I found a few others down the road too. <clears throat> so 
I don't know if what I saw was the Sykesville monster or uh, what it was, but quite frankly, there have been other sightings there even to the, this day. And a lot of that is uh, a lot of that's built up now. So uh, there's still something rooming around there. Absolutely. I mean, I, it just it makes you wonder. I mean, what are your thoughts and theories as to the origins of Bigfoot? Because you hear so many different things. You hear interdimensional being. You hear um, yeah. it's a flesh and blood creature. I mean, what are your thoughts on it? I, I think it's a flesh and blood creature. But I think it has the ability to cloak itself at some degree. Um, I think those sightings of these creatures in the Pacific Northwest, in Florida, along the Gulf Coast, and a few other places up in Canada, I, I think those are indigenous beings. Uh, I, I think they are actually uh, a part of the fauna. Uh, you know, you, when you... When you hear of sightings in in like Florida and and Pacific Northwest, there are a lot of sightings of family groups and more than one. Yes, in other parts of the United States in in Eastern Canada, many times it's just one. Uh, now, is that just a a singular uh, Bigfoot or Sasquatch that's able to cloak itself, or is it interdimensional? Is it moving in and out of some uh, some dimension or is it even extraterrestrial? Who knows? Right. Yeah, I've heard that theory too. And you, you, you. There's a lot of theories out there, and but I know the one I saw was definitely flesh and blood. But who's to say it wasn't something that can move in and out? If it even was one, I mean, I don't know. You know, because of what happened and the government thing involvement. Yeah. And all, who knows what this thing was? Exactly. Yeah, that makes sense. But you do hear of them. Uh, existing on like you know near rivers and creeks and near the banks and all that and you happen to see one right there so I don't know I mean there's so many theories circulating I, I agree too I think it is some sort of flesh and blood creature but you hear of both similarities and differences in terms of different regions so yeah. that's you know opens up a whole another door yeah um, I mean, there, there are a lot of people that dispute that and I can understand that you know not everybody's open-minded to, you know, the uh, the interdimensional or possibly a, a supernatural cryptid being. But, yeah. uh, you know, we have a lot of other cryptids that pop up here and there. You know, uh, I, I think for the most part, cryptid sightings are supernatural sightings. And, Absolutely. Uh, Hi, Michael. Know, just like Upright Canines, Dog Man, same thing. We've had a lot of that here in Pennsylvania. And... Um, you know, th there's some aspects to the reports that just make you sit up and wonder, you know, this isn't right. You know, of course, this thing isn't can't be indigenous. You know, we got we got these tall uh, werewolf like beings that look almost like the lichens from the Underworld series. You know, they're <laughs> huge. Oh my God. I mean, nine, ten foot. Seriously, we've had hunters that have walked up on these things. They stand their ground. But the hunter ain't gonna shoot this thing with bird shot. Just, just no way in hell it's gonna adapt him. So, yeah, uh, and you know, I think the like most cryptids, they have some type of uh, infrasound abilities to kind of yes. stun people. So, uh, I but I, you know, we've also had quadruped, uh, dogman-like creatures. Uh, you know, a sighting we had in particular was up around Tuscarora State Park where uh, this, this hunter was up in his blind and he's sitting up there watching this thing crossing the field. He's up there deer hunting and this huge canine uh, saunters up to in front of him, sits down the field, sitting there looking at him. They, he said the back, it was kind of sloped like a hyena. Yeah. had muscular arms and legs and had the head of a wolf and he said this thing was huge and it just watched him like he was the next you know he was coming for the dinner bell so uh yeah he said it sat there for about 15 minutes and walked off he stayed up there for at least an hour because he wasn't coming down and uh right i don't took, blame him yeah he eventually came down and left but god knows what he saw i mean you know you do hear a lot of sense. crossover between Bigfoot and Dogman. I know Linda had a question in chat, Linda Meyer. She said, have you have you done any act 
active recent investigation of Bigfoot? Like recently? I don't know. If she means like within well, the last month or yeah, not not recently. Um many times uh the big you know, we get a Bigfoot sighting in an in area, and you know, I'm I don't go out like I used to. Uh, but I, I, I have plenty of people on my team that can go out there and look and they, I mean, they beg me to give them reports. So, uh, we've got 20 people, 22 people on my team. And, uh, you know, I got people locally that can go into Pennsylvania, New York, or wherever else, and they'll do the investigations. And that's what I do. I send it off to them. Uh, if they can't do it, then I've got 15 other affiliate groups that will handle it as well. So yeah, that's, that's amazing. a pretty nice network. Yeah, there's something awesome about that whole area out there, Pennsylvania, Maryland, all of that. I just, I, I love it. I mean, it just, this is kind of off topic, but it makes me wonder, why am I still in San Diego? I mean, it's a nice city, yes. <laughs> yeah, but I, I just to move oh, to San I, Diego at one point. <laughs> oh, funny. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll swap places. But, you know, <laughs> I, you I'm a... I'm biased because I am a believer in, in, in cryptids and supernatural beings, but what's your personal way of handling someone who is just such a cynic, you know, Oh no, there's no such thing as those. And no way, no way, no way at all. I mean, how do you handle that? I don't even get in an argument with them. You know, yeah, see there, you, that's, know, you can believe what you want yes, to believe. Exactly. I, you know, I don't care. Ex yeah. But, but the, uh, the funniest thing is when you get somebody who was a skeptic, and then has an encounter. Yeah. And then yeah. they're like, yeah, well, I never thought that thing was out there, but I saw it. So I believe now. And okay. <laughs> that's kind of that neat a to lot. see that. Yeah. It's kind of neat to see that. You know, yeah. you don't want to say, I told you so. But then again, it's, you know, um, yeah, it's just, it's so fascinating. Okay. So you have, you take reports from all kinds of individuals. Are there ever any, I'm sure this has happened to you, but are there ever any circumstances where you can outright tell when someone's just maybe making something up or embellishing? Like yeah. what's your, I mean, besides just common sense, what's your poly or what's your way of trying to determine that? Well, my policy is to listen to anybody who wants to talk or send a report. Uh, I give everybody the benefit of the doubt at first, but you know, yeah. after I look yeah. into it and uh, determine the viability of it, then I'll make my decision either to have somebody look at it or just to uh, discount it in hand, you know. So, uh, you know, when you, when you take a report from someone, you had just become re a part of that encounter or the report. So, you know, yes. I believe that you're, obligated to look in it as most best you can mm -hmm. and take as much time as you can to do it but if it's obviously you know faked or you know some yeah. type of uh, lie or such I, I won't even bother with it yeah that's 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 pretty smart and professional to do you know you can i mean and then it's common sense too you can just kind of tell when someone's yeah. you know not really being truthful but uh getting back to dog man now that creature's, from what I know, is I guess more associated with. Is it Michigan? Is that where when the, I think I read that it was first encountered in Michigan? But I know there have been other people that have encountered it as well. I'm wondering. There's a lot of I've heard a lot of uh, crossover between Dogman and Bigfoot. I think they're two separate beings. But well, I'm there have been reports that could have been you know could have been confused. Right, the, right. The Michigan dog man, the initial the initial Michigan dog man was a hoax. I mean, the uh the film that was associated with it and all that, that the the cable film, that that was the gable film, excuse me. That yeah. was uh, that was a hoax. I remember reading that, but there have been other right. sightings there but too. But there have been other sightings. Right. And, I mean, I had a lot of sightings, especially in the upper peninsula of, of Michigan, that seemed to be pretty viable. Uh, Wisconsin has a lot of sightings, especially in the south central part of the state. Yes, uh, yes. The Moran area and down into uh, the Bray Road and that part. Uh, of course, Linda Godfrey has looked into that for, for years. And uh, those sightings seem to hold up. Uh, I've talked to several people who either own property there or have been 
or had an encounter with one of these things. And, uh, you know, Linda actually made a pretty, a pretty good film not too long ago about it. And, uh, yeah, it's intriguing. But, it you know, the, the whole upright canine and dogman phenomena is has kind of spread out into other states, in particular, well, Ohio, you know, uh, Pennsylvania. Yes. Uh, yeah, all the upper Midwest. Um, it's becoming more prevalent. So, uh, I don't I've know. Seen I mean, that it spread. Yeah, uh, that seems to be the old Rust Belt, I guess, would be what you consider dogman, big, I mean, upright canine territory. Yeah, and it, it's just all of this is just so fascinating. And it's, you know, it makes me wonder too if, if some of the sightings people may think they're seeing, you know, a half man have canine creature but in reality maybe it's bigfoot or vice versa you know i've not seen either yet so i'm i'm waiting for that day i'm open to it uh but uh, it's just it's just so fascinating we only have about 10 minutes left what is your most unusual encounter that you've ever come across well i had an encounter or, with a wing a wing humanoid back in 1988 you mentioned yeah and uh the funny thing about that is that humanoid that I saw, me and two other people saw, was very similar to what's been seen in Chicago recently. Uh, I was uh, I had met up with a friend of mine who I went to school with. Uh, we were down in Baltimore, and um, you know we were sitting there having lunch, and he mentioned to me about uh, he knew I was in the paranormal. He used to go to Gettysburg with me when we were kids. We used to camp. Oh out. wow. Yeah, so he knew nice. what I was into. So he asked me, he said, look, um, he said, a friend of mine and I, and they were both scout masters at the time, we're going up to Camp Conewago next week because those, those troops have been uh, camping out in the woods and they're getting run out because they're hearing all these crazy screams at night and they don't know what the hell they're dealing with. I said, okay, well, I'll go up there. So I, next weekend I went up there. And, uh, you know, I met him and his buddy and we hiked into the woods. We set up camp, got everything all set up, three different tents, got a fire going. And by that time, it was about six in the evening. So we were sitting around. Nothing went, nothing happened that night. That was a Friday night. So uh, we, um, you know, we just went to sleep and uh, but we did all three of us heard something moving around in the campsite. And, you know, I thought maybe it was one of those guys getting up using the latrine or whatever. I yeah. Know. Uh, right. But when we got up and mentioned it to each other about all the sound, we looked around, nothing was disturbed. So we figured maybe it was a deer or something got into the, you know, there's a lot of wildlife up there. So anyway, that day we were hiking out into the woods. We, we were out pretty long. We were out about most of the day just getting a sense of the area. Maybe we could find out what was causing all this screaming sounds and stuff. And uh, we got back to camp, I guess, about six or seven. It was starting to come dusk by that time because uh, it was in the fall. And uh, it got dark, real bright night. The moon was really bright that night. So we're sitting around talking football, whatever, you know, and then we hear about 11 o'clock, this screaming sound. And, you know, quite honestly, I, I thought it was just like, you know, an animal scream of some type. I didn't even mm -hmm. think, you know, I didn't think much of it. You know, you hear a lot of stuff out in the woods at night. So not long after that, we heard another scream. Now, this sounded like a woman or a child screaming. And it was loud because it was kind of moving in and out, too. So wow. we're thinking, okay, and what the hell is this? You know, this is something unusual. So we just sat there and uh, we were hoping to hear it again. But, you know, so I guess about one o'clock or so, I, you know, we were still sitting here talking and I got up, stretched my legs and I walked out onto the trail because the trail was right there and it was right along the Conewago Creek. And the creek was real shallow that time of year. So, uh, you know, I, I got this sense that ah, there's something going on. I, I just sense something weird. You know, you get that feeling, and you so get that walk, feeling, yeah. Yeah, so I and it doesn't back. leave either. No, it doesn't. You get back. I got back. It doesn't leave. <laughs> and I told those guys, I said, "Look, let's grab the flashlights, go up on the trail a bit, and you know, see if we see anything." Okay. So 
we're in a line, we're walking down the trail, didn't get more than 50 foot from, from the campsite. And we all three saw this thing standing in the creek. Oh, the big right, the red eyes, I'm bright red eyes. And by the time we got our flashlights on this thing, it jettisoned up into the air. And it and was gone, a whooshing sound. Oh, my gosh. And it, when it got to its apex, we heard it scream. And it was loud. And then it took off and it was screaming as it went away. So we got back to campsite. I mean, we were running back to campsite. Those guys were freaked. You know, I... You know, I, I was, I guess I was, I hate to admit, I, maybe I was scared a bit, but my buddy was really scared. I mean, he wasn't even talking. So oh me and the other guy, I can imagine. We, and my we, gosh. All, we, we said, well, we saw the red eyes. I mean, what the hell is that all about? You know, of course I knew about the Mothman stuff by that time. And I didn't even imagine I saw a Mothman, but the, the guy said, you know, did you notice all that stuff on its back? And I did, there were some structures on the back. But if it was wings, it never opened up. You know, it just jettisoned as the way, way it was. So uh, my friend, he was he wasn't going to stick around there. So him and the other guy went up to the administration building, and they slept up there for the night. But I was by myself the rest of the night. I wanted to know what the hell that thing was. You brave soul! My goodness, you but know, I, I you know nothing else happened. It was quiet the rest of the night. Oh my goodness. You know, I probably would have done the same thing though. Cause you know, you're curious, right? Mm. You know, Linda actually asked and it's funny because I was thinking the same thing. So she literally uh, adopted the same question I had, but when to go and, do and uh, dogmen, do you think they're the same thing? No, no. Yeah. Basically a when to go is a possessed human. Uh, right. You read yeah. Chad Lewis's book and he put out a very good book about when to goes uh, and the lore behind it. It's, um, it's basically a human who's affected somehow either by some type of entity or uh, a sickness as such and becomes a cannibal, basically. Uh, they literally kill and eat uh, humans and whatever they got. And that's the real gist of a Wendigo. Um, yeah, I've heard of, of his book. Of, I haven't read it yet. But yeah, it's a it. great book. Um but, you know, there's been a lot of connotations about Wendigos and such, you know. Right. Uh, and, uh, you know, years. many of the tribes up in the up in Canada or the uh, upper Midwest and such, you, you know, had the Wendigo lore, believe it's a, uh, you know, some type of spirit or, you know, something that affects a man or such. But no, it's, right. it's nothing related to the dog man. Yeah, you get different variations of it and such. Mm -hmm. Oh, my goodness. I mean, I have, like, so many more questions for you. I'm going to have to have you back on if you want sometime in the future. You got me. You know, anytime you want me. Yeah, three minutes left. Oh, my goodness. I mean, God, there's so... I mean, I wanted to get into black-eyed kids and, like, <laughs> you know, uh, what else here? I mean, fair, the fae, gnomes, all of that good stuff. Uh, but I'll have, definitely have you back on. Thank you so much for coming on. What? Uh, so people, if they want to reach you, obviously, or your website, phantomsandmonsters.com. Uh, but you have books as well. Where can people buy your books? Because you have many of them. Yeah, they're on uh, they're on Amazon, and uh, I do have a new publisher now. Um, uh, Beyond the Free Publishing is my new publisher. So many of these books are being republished, okay. and uh, the first five books are actually going to be edited and put into one big volume eventually. And uh, oh, great! That's yeah. awesome. So. Uh, you know, uh, I am working on another book now uh, about the uh, the pale humanoids, the uh, crawlers and walkers, and and some of the uh, some of the sightings that are associated with that. Uh, that's a phenomena that's fairly new. I can't uh, wait. But it's going. It's happening nationwide and all over North America. So. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm learning more as I go into that because oh my uh, gosh, just a lot of stuff. Yeah. and I'm learning from you. Where I mean, Linda just said, "Yeah, he's coming back," and Michael Lachiana <laughs> said, "Oh my god, I forget what Michael said, but he said something awesome." Um, I'm sorry, Michael, I totally forgot what you just said, but it was an awesome <laughs> comment. And there goes Kaylee, my cat. She always seems to meow either at the beginning or end of the show. But uh, she's going to be 18 years old on August 18th. So yay! Yeah, I got one up here too. He's, I know. He's going to be 16. 
Wow. Yeah. See that? I love it. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much for coming on. And uh, again, Phantoms and Monsters, the blog is amazing. It's a syndicated, very popular blog. I think you've had something like 33 million views or something like that. If I read yeah, that, something like that, read the stats, right? So amazing. If you want anything on cryptids, pretty much anything, go to phantomsandmonsters.com. Also check out Lon's books on Amazon as well. I will have you back on, so we'll definitely book something. Yeah, I want to get you on too, and we'll talk about this Queen Mary situation. Oh, yeah, there's a lot that's not true in the news. Uh, Well, we'll find out. We'll find out exactly. So anyways, uh, a huge thanks to Lon for coming on. Like I said, we'll get him back on soon. Next week, I have the Reaps on. They're going to talk all about their investigations and their research into the paranormal and then of course on the 19th i have a reschedule with marie d jones and then the 26th i have uh tristan david luciotti and seth michael to talk about the all around us documentary fabulous document documentary and then of course their research as well so i want to thank my listeners tonight for tuning in to another episode of the afterlife chronicles and as always we are bridging the gap between mortality and the afterlife one experience at a time. See you next week, guys, and have a great night and a great weekend.